Hey everyone, and welcome to another Kanoa Reviews, where we review games both new and old on all platforms. If you like the content that I make, then please subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell so you never miss a review when it comes out. Today we talk about Final Fantasy XIV Heavensward, the first expansion of FF14 which of course last month exploded in popularity after World of Warcraft released a disappointing patch after 8 months of non-content, several huge WoW streamers migrating to FF14 as well, and then, also near the end of the month, the whole lawsuit debacle on the dirty things happening at Blizzard. Now Heaven's Word is the last content that you can still play for free and concentrates on level 50 to level 60 gameplay and story. Before we continue, I highly recommend you to check out my Final Fantasy A Realm Reborn review if you haven't already done so. Personally, I think it's one of the better reviews I have done since we go quite in depth on the story experience that this game offers and in my opinion, I present a far more realistic image than some YouTubers are making it seem to be since they just want to tag in on the whole hype. I've seen several YouTubers have thumbnails and titles stating, Oh, I've been playing the wrong MMO for 15 years, or The starting experience for FF14 is so much better. And the truth of the matter is that no, the starting experience of FF14 is just okay and won't do a whole lot you haven't seen done before in other MMORPGs. Now the expansions, however, are of a very different nature, and that is why I am so happy that we finally get to talk about the first of these expansions as Final Fantasy finally seemed to take some steps into the right direction to really elevate this title to the next level. Let's dive deeper into this massive expansion. Now in my Realm Reborn review, I pretty much talk about the game all the way up to the first credits roll after you have taken out the Ultima weapon. Now technically, the game still got several patches and an epilogue within A Realm Reborn that at the same time also functioned as a prologue and build up for Heaven's Ward. I stated in my review already then that because it feels so much like a prologue and also very different from the actual vanilla A Realm Reborn experience, that I would not be taking it into account for the A Realm Reborn review. And though I received a comment that this epilogue content should have been taken into account, I absolutely disagree after completely playing it. It truly feels like a new chapter within the story itself, and though there are still references and some consequences to what has happened within the vanilla story, it all revolves around the events and circumstances that shape Heaven's Ward, which makes it, in my opinion, make way more sense to put this within the Heaven's Ward review. Whereas with Heaven's Ward, the epilogue directly follows the events and something that happens at the end, meaning that the first few patches that came out felt like a proper end to that storyline, aptly being ended with a beautiful cutscene of the Heaven's Ward book being closed. The patches then afterward felt like the beginning of a new chapter slowly working towards Stormblood, etc. But because of that though, for the first few moments in this review, we will talk about some of the later patches of A Realm Reborn and then ease our way into the main Heaven's Ward content. So let's finally talk about the game. The character that I made, Azora Ishtimars, got soon called out to move on to another adventure after taking down the Imperial Stronghold led by Van Belsar. I will yet again link my long play of Final Fantasy XIV so you can witness the journey my character made all the way from the beginning up to Heaven's Ward. It's a great way to experience the main story content the game has to offer. With the first event that transpires after having beaten the main game, you are tasked with dealing with a situation within the forest as a Moogle King has been summoned as a primal. This storyline definitely feels as filler, but the cute Moogles make up for some funny dialogue and it all feels a bit like a cooling down after having just saved the realm from despair and the Ultima weapon. What's more is that the end of this story arc is really cool with an awesome boss battle against King Mog and his minions. With this battle, we of course have to talk about the music. It's very clearly an homage to the style and song from A Nightmare Before Christmas, which is incredibly popular in Japan in general. The King Mog song has the same style, tempo and lyrical sound, which makes it very catchy and stand out. You will have this great song stuck in your head for a very long time afterward, and it makes it pretty fun to redo the fight over if you failed the first time. Though, I can imagine that it might drive you nuts if you have to do the extreme version over and over and over again. But not only the music is great, but the mechanics in the fight are also far greater than the vanilla dungeons or boss fights in A Realm Reborn. If anything, the dungeons and bosses in A Realm Reborn are quite disappointing since most don't offer too many interesting mechanics and basically come down to just standing there and spamming the attack and skill buttons over and over again. 
Sure, there are some late raids that have more interesting mechanics, but the overall main story, which is 35 to 40 hours, is kind of bland. Here, however, you have some more coordinations involved, since you need to first take care of all the king's minions and focus on the strongest or the most obnoxious moogles like the black mage or the healer. The king will eventually also spawn with their hilarious ritual and then resurrect all his minions to where you have to quickly take them down while distracting the main boss as he is more powerful the more minions are alive. It's a great fight where each member has their own task and properly contributes as different teams work together to take all the enemies down. Then thereafter, the story focuses on the fishbacks having summoned the Leviathan Primal as you head out to Limsa Lominsa, interacting with old and familiar characters as you prepare to take down this giant sea snake. And the cool thing here is that where I thought that the Moogle King boss fight was already an improvement on the boss fights compared to A Realm Reborn, the Leviathan battle is even better. First, the setup is awesome, with you and your group fighting on this giant floating ship, while Leviathan is terrorizing it with tidal waves and lashing out at anyone daring to come too close. The interesting thing with this fight is that depending on what class you are, you either need to attack the head or its tail. Melee units can attack whichever, but the head is invulnerable to physical damage, so archers would need to focus on the tail, which then at the same time is invulnerable to magic, so casters would then need to focus on the head. There are some awesome moments where Leviathan shifts places and slams down on the ship, which you have to avoid, but also will throw you off balance, sending everyone flying all over the place. And it at the same time also needs some coordination with the group, since its most deadly attack can only be avoided by turning on the shield that protects the entire party. It's yet again a boss fight where you have to do more than just stand there and fight, and this is greatly appreciated. It's so much more fun when there are things going on, and yes, though it can be a bit more stressful, it overall makes for a way more enjoyable and fun boss fight. In the story arc afterwards, you then will have to face the Primal Ramu, and though it indeed feels like you are just hopping from Primal to Primal to Primal, which from a story perspective isn't too engaging or interesting, at the same time you partake in a much bigger and long story arc that is actually really fantastic. The Ul'da storyline is incredible, and one of the reasons why this feels like a proper new chapter and new beginning for so many of the characters and you as a player. This whole storyline plays out over several chapters, all the way up to the launch of Heaven's Ward, but basically it starts with you returning to Ul'da as refugees from the land of Doma have arrived on your borders and seek asylum as their homes have come under attack from the Garlean Empire. Ulda already had to deal with lots of refugees from Alamigo and had to refuse them and instead relocate them somewhere else where they lived on their miserable circumstances. Now the Domans also get refused by Ulda's council, but Minfilia, the leader of the Science of the Seven Dawn, has agreed to take them in at the village where they relocated their base towards. This new base location, by the way, is great since it feels much more expansive instead of the dusty cellars of Vesper Bay. The Rising Stones feels like a proper home base with an area where the heroes can rest after a long journey. It feels so much more homely, and there are plenty of new recruits and characters you can talk to that have interesting things to say. It gets you excited to see what progress has been made with the Science of the Seven Dawn and keeps you guessing on what comes next. I sometimes caught myself not simply rushing towards the main chamber to get my next quest, but first talk to the people I liked like Ishtola, Thancred, Gurianje, Tataru, Papa Limo, or my personal favorite, Ida. But back to the Ulda storyline. So the Domans are able to move in within the town, where the Scions now reside, but what I love about the storyline is that it's logical since the consequences of this action make sense, but the characters' reaction then at the same time also makes sense. Since the Doman refugees have been accepted by the Scions, word of course had spread all across the realm, and not long after, other refugees from other nations stand on your doorstep to ask for aid as well. But the town and Scions are simply too small to provide aid to everyone and are forced to turn them down. It showcases the effect it has, were one to offer help to a few, but then there are also many who actually require it. You cannot help but feel sorry for these people pleading for help, but also realize that you don't have the provisions, room or power to help them. This refugee issue then stands at the base of a revolt that happens within Ulda, and though you don't actually take part in these revolts or see them directly, you can definitely feel that something is stirring and is quite amiss. A deeper and darker plot is boiling beneath the sands, and it just has you asking questions and guessing on who or what is responsible for this. 
You, for example, afterward need to trail a merchant who is responsible for providing the refugee riders with military-grade weaponry and also stirring them up to revolt against the people inside the city. Once you capture the merchant, he gets brutally executed before he can tell you much. The moment is genuinely surprising and has you realize that this goes even deeper than you first imagined. Slowly the game gives you more and more story and background, with at a certain point revealing that a mysterious figure, under the name the Ivy, is also responsible for the stirrups in the city and this mysterious Ivy person is undercover within General Rauban's own units. To my absolute surprise, the traitor amongst Rauban's units was none other than his second in command, the female elf with the glasses. I think her name is Ryu or something. The twist that she is the actual traitor comes at a huge but great surprise and has you hoping that the conflict will be subdued after taking her into custody. You also are able to take her down with the help of the newly formed Crystal Braves, a new force led by none other than your trusted friend Alphano. This army does not owe loyalty to any particular nation, but instead the realm itself, meaning they will have jurisdiction wherever they go. A noble and genuinely awesome story as well, as you head to all the major cities and recruit people you have already met during the main story of the Realm Reborn. Though you are not able to recruit her, I was delighted to run, for example, into the girl I saved in Ulda from a bunch of muggers, and thought it was great that the game has you meet these minor characters again that in their eyes have not forgotten about the great help that you gave them. It shows that the creators pay attention to the story and its details and offer these tiny bits of fan service to remind you of the things that you have done. It's honestly great. And at the same time, as this is all happening with the Crystal Braves and the Unris and Ulda, your help is also required in the Cold North, as Dravanian heretics have grown restless against its guardians. Though me explaining all of this in this sense, it might look like it's very chaotic storytelling, but I should note that each storyline gets its appropriate attention and time in the spotlight and it feels like each story evolves naturally with you never knowing what is behind the next corner. This is proper and great storytelling that makes you want to continue unlike the bland storytelling in the vanilla A Realm Reborn. See, if you at the beginning already establish what the entire storyline will be, the story itself won't be that engaging. If you know at the beginning, oh, okay, so I have to go out there and collect six or seven different colored crystals and that's it, then basically you've already explained the entire story with that one sentence. With this type of storytelling, however, each step that you take provides new information and answers, while at the same time also throwing up new questions. Now the Ishgard storyline starts out a bit slow and not that interesting with you just going on several patrols or fighting clutters of heretics, but it picks up pace along the way and is basically the main storyline necessary to understand Heaven's Ward main area and content. You will slowly learn more about the leader of the heretics who goes under the name Lady Iceheart. While you take out her forces, you at the same time also have to partake in some dungeons and even get to fight her as she turns into the primal Shiva. The absolute highlight of this storyline is when you reach a specific dungeon that has you fight the dragon Midgard Summer. The dungeon itself is okay with some awesome moments like environmental destruction and the realization that you are traversing over the back of a giant dragon. But the end boss fight itself is the real highlight and a true joy to play as the distance DPS. Midgard Summer has so many different and interesting attacks with AoE that you need to dodge and move out of the way of. There is a great variation in the patterns that you need to avoid and the scale and epicness of the fight leaves a genuine awesome impression on you. It even made me realize that I probably think, though of course it all depends on which boss fight in particular, that Final Fantasy's boss fights are more fun as a ranged unit since tanks and close range units often only need to worry about a tank swap or avoiding cones or circles around the unit itself. The ranged players will get thrown all kinds of weird patterns, conditions or target reticules on them and will need to constantly be sharp and keep on the move to avoid everything. Battles that have a lot of mechanics and movement are always the most fun in my opinion, since MMO combat in general is pretty bland and repetitive. It's constantly being able to quickly move and dodge that keeps things fresh. Though of course there are also plenty of awesome mechanics that don't have anything to do with dodging, like activating shields or the cannons, or activating certain switches requiring a number of players to stand on particular platforms. And yes, by this time we are still only talking about the epilogue and prologue, which means technically it's still a Realm Reborn content. 
I have to say that I was absolutely flabbergasted and blown away by how massive these post main game content stories were. I personally expected the epilogue to be maybe 4 or 5 hours, but it took me up to 20 hours to just get through all the epilogue stuff to start out Heaven's Word. Heaven's Word itself is then around 16 to 17 hours or so, providing you with so much gaming content to the point where it's ludicrous. Again, we are still talking about the content which you can experience during the trial and therefore is completely free. Also, what is mandatory to continue the main story is to take part in the raid the Crystal Tower. Now Heaven's Word actually did not have me partake in any raids that were mandatory, which in all honesty felt a bit like a disappointment, but also at the same time somewhat of a relief, since the weakest part of the Crystal Tower is its story arc. Basically, you, some researchers, and Nero, yes, I screamed oh my goodness when I was revealed that the Masked Man was in fact Nero, are ascending this ancient crystal tower to unlock the secrets held by an ancient civilization. The story basically comes down to, we go up and up and then the door is locked, find or do something to unlock the next gate or floor and then do another raid and we go up some more stairs again. It's very basic, and though of course the real highlight, and this is the actual raid itself, the motivation to keep continuing was not as high as with some real climactic story raids in something like World of Warcraft. But when it comes to its gameplay and boss mechanics, Crystal Tower is excellent, with some awesome, awesome fights, where the 24-man raid need to split up into multiple groups with each a different objective or assignment. The music is also, especially in Circus Tower, amazing and had me so pumped to do some of these fights over and over again when we wiped. Now, the raid wasn't super hard like the Coils of Bahamut, but it wasn't easy either. The most we probably wiped on a boss was two or three times, but no more than that. Maybe they took the mandatory story raids out of the main story quest in later expansions since they were afraid that some people found it too hard or did not want to interact with so many other people but I had a blast and look forward to the other raids in upcoming expansions. Along the way, you also are met with a new member of the Scions who goes under the name Moon Brita. A great addition and well likable character as she's very headstrong and smart and has a very amusing relationship with Uriange. Where she is very physical and affectionate towards him, he pretends not to care or is clearly pretty uncomfortable with this in front of others despite the game also making it clear he deeply, deeply cares for Moonbrida. I'm sure that somewhere out there on the internet there are plenty of Moonbrida and Uriange fanfics or fan art. Moonbrida is a great asset to the team and provides a way to deal with the Ashen threat, the evil mages dressed in the dark robes. Moonbrida's time, however, is pretty short-lived as an eventful clash with one particular Ashen has her choose to sacrifice herself to imprison the evil mage. I'm sure people were surprised to how quickly this moment arrived since it hinted at all likeliness that this character would be a new major member he would get to know in many upcoming patches. But the reality is that she only played a small part but nevertheless left a huge impression. And I personally do really love this. I will address this more in other moments in the story, but having characters that can die at any moment makes it to where it is exciting. No one is on the edge of their seat if they know that the characters all will be okay. There are no stakes to be had, nothing to lose, and that makes it a bit dull and boring. It's something that I believe Game of Thrones has not invented, but definitely has put on the greater spectrum, and I've seen several other shows and games utilize this, where any character can possibly die very suddenly, but this keeps you on the edge of your seat and always wanting to know what comes next. And then on that subject of people suddenly dying, let's now talk about THE cutscene. It is the absolute best moment in the game so far, with such a great and incredible payoff to the Ulda storyline that just has been building and building and building. This cutscene, or technically follow-up of several cutscenes, is what made the game's story rise to a level above MMORPG storytelling for me. With this event and this cutscene, Final Fantasy XIV's story could now compete with stories of other single-player RPGs and games. I am talking, of course, about the cutscene and event where Sultana Nanamo gets poisoned. This scene is set up by having all the leaders from the different nations assemble for a feast at Uldan after being victorious over the invading dragon on the bridge leading to Ishgard. Yet again, a storyline that is great with some awesome political play on the background too, which is written in a way that makes sense. 
Ishgard has always refrained from helping the other nations in their hour of need, but when they seem threatened, they call for their aid. Elfino correctly assumes that because of the Ishgard's previous stance on helping the others out, he warns the leader that their help will not come without conditions. And in all honesty, this is how those political games are always played, whether in a good written story or in actual reality. When it comes to politics, rarely does a certain action come purely out of kindness. There's always an ulterior motive or reason for gain. When all the leaders are assembled in Uldah, you are called towards the royal chambers of the Sultana Nanamo. Here she reveals to you that she plans to abdicate to build a democracy within Uldah and asks you to help Rauban in those turmoil times to come. When you agree, she is so relieved and takes a sip of her chalice. Suddenly her eyes open wide and she grabs at her throat as tears swell and blur her gaze. She then falls to the floor dead and this all happens in a matter of a few seconds. It honestly comes as a huge shock, though the antagonistic Telegi Adelegi has by this point already hinted in that he plotted against the Sultanate. At the same time, Alphano is called away to meet with some of his Crystal Brave soldiers and is then suddenly taken hostage as a coup takes place amongst the Crystal Brave ranks. It turns out that this special military force that you helped create is actually full of traitors who are paid by someone else to do his bidding. It's just one shocking moment after the other, and it doesn't stop there. You are arrested as you are the only other person within the room with the Sultana, and Teleji and his soldiers storm inside the royal banquet hall where all the leaders and guests are enjoying the festivities. Here Teleji announces the death of Nanamo, and that it was you who was responsible. Nobody can believe it, and especially Rauban is in shock for letting down his royal highness. Teleji throws some salt in the wounds by insulting Nanamo multiple times in Rauban's face, and what follows next is some of the most awesome scenes I can remember in recent history in gaming. It's even kind of Game of Thrones level. Within a heap of rage, Rauban loses it as he accuses Teleji of assassinating the Sultana and with an awesome move cleaves the Lafalel bastard in half. Oh my goodness, I was screaming at my monitor when all these things occurred. First Nanamo is poisoned, then Alphano is captured by a coup within the Crystal Braves, and now Teleji Adeleji, who many of us probably thought would be the next main bad guy in the stories to come, gets brutally and suddenly executed. Rauban then charges at the other royalist, Lolorito, and gets stopped by his former friend Ilbert. In a sudden and yet another shocking moment, Ilbert cuts off Rauban's arm and leaves him bleeding on the floor. What is happening in this game? I screamed at the monitor in a scene that kind of reminded me of the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones, as though it wasn't nearly as brutal, still so many shocking things happened one after the other. And these moments of not knowing if anyone is safe, not knowing who will make it out alive or not, is what makes a story so compelling. Obviously, it also depends on what kind of story, since you won't have that with a romantic storyline or detective storyline, etc. But here, where there's a big sense of adventure, it really adds to feeling engaged and involved, as you want to see all the characters you care for make it out alive. But that sense of not knowing if they are safe is what makes it so cool. After Rauban is left bleeding on the floor, Ilbert taunts him by telling him it was he who poisoned Nanamo, and in a fit of rage, Rauban battles Ilbert in an awesome battle where he can still keep up even with one arm. It also should be said that the writing yet again is fantastic, as in an earlier engagement with the Imperial spy the Ivy, Ilbert holds a strong monologue about how life has not treated him fair, but he always stuck with those he trusted and called brothers. He literally says that he'd rather cut off his own arm than to betray his friend. And lo and behold what happens. He betrays his friend and cuts off the arm of the friend that he betrays. Now that is some fantastic foreshadowing. Within the chaos of the fight, you manage to break free and you and the other scions flee the castle to get outside the walls. While this is happening, the group gets split up into smaller groups where they have some awesome fights with the incoming enemy soldiers. Though you can definitely tell where it's going in that the group will become smaller and smaller and eventually you will be the only one to escape, the cutscenes of them battling are still awesome with especially Ida using her limit break being spectacular. When you are outside the walls, you manage to reunite with Alphano, who was rescued by Pippin, the adopted son of Rauban, and managed to escape via a merchant wagon with the actual merchant from the first opening cutscene. It all comes full circle, and I could not believe how perfect these cutscenes were. 
It was just incredible and I was just glued to my screen. You manage to eventually meet up with Sid and escape towards the cold north of Curthus, where you will head towards Ishgard to lay low until things have settled down in the realms below. And this is where A Realm Reborn then officially ends. Credits roll yet again, something I personally found a bit weird, but was pretty handy to know when to watch the Heavensward cutscene. And then there were still a few stingers that were also big shocking oh my god moments. First, it is revealed that the Handmaiden of Nanamo was in on the poisoning, and that the true architect behind this was none other than the monetarist Lodorito. But the biggest what the hell moment comes afterward, where we see two Ashens talk to one another about the events and then it is revealed that none other than Urianje is also at their side. Yet another betrayal and just shocking moment after shocking moment to where these cutscenes and this ending or beginning, however you see fit, is one of the best in gaming in general. So much has happened in such a small time period, and though yes, you have many new questions, many others you already had were answered. It's not like World of Warcraft storytelling as of late, where you only have questions and none of it is answered. So yeah, we are now officially and finally within Heaven's War territory, so let's talk about how this experience holds up. Now after the thrilling roller coaster of the last few cutscenes, the game of course steps off the gas to give you some breathing space and get acquainted with the new main hub, Ishgard. This giant gothic city is beautiful and a joy to explore, as it's built very vertically with the poor and hopeless living in the broom all the way at the bottom, whereas the wealthy and fortunate feast all the way above. Ever being loomed over by the massive cathedral known as the Vault, where the Archbishop rules with the Iron Fist of God. The style and scope of Ishgard honestly reminded me a bit of Dark Souls, which is massive castles and towers filling up the entire sky. In all honesty, for a very long time, I've thought that because the game also came out on the PlayStation 3, that graphically it would really hold the game back. And to a certain degree, I do actually still believe that. Many of the outdoor zones are pretty empty, and many different loading screens also adhere to this. Now the later expansions of course did not release on the PlayStation 3 anymore, so hopefully we will see some true graphical strides there, which I am very much looking forward to. But all in all, I can say that there is a clear graphical upgrade with Heaven's Ward, with locations being way more fantastical and grand. Whether it's Dravania with its blooming cherry blossom trees, or the floating islands with the giant vegetation in all shapes and colors. The first thing I want to note, however, about the Ishgard experience, and this is not something you have to deal with if you are playing this game with Japanese voices, but that is the change of pretty much all of the voice cast of the characters in the English spoken version. Everyone from Alphino to Ida to Thancred, Rauban, Tataru, and more have a different voice actor. And though I will say that pretty much all of the new cast are better at actual acting, it was still so jarring and took me a long time to get adjusted to. Yes, the actual acting of the old voice cast was pretty atrocious. I talk about this too in the uh, Realm Reborn review. But I got used to it over time and also felt they improved towards the later patches. Even though I said that I feel that the acting of the new actors is better, I still think that the actual sound of the voices themselves are better with some of the old cast. It's not something that has any actual impact on the score, but it's something that is very jarring and took me a lot of hours to get accustomed to. I'm also not entirely sure why they changed all the voice cast, so if someone in the comments can let me know, that would be greatly appreciated. There are also more voice active cutscenes in general with Heaven's Ward and the Realm Reborn epilogue, which is greatly appreciated. Though the writing is still absolutely solid within the cutscenes that have no audible dialogue, it does make the game age significantly compared to where there is proper audio. Within Ishgard, you get familiar with a whole bunch of characters, some of which, like Sir Harshafont or the Dragoon Astinian, you've already met during A Realm Reborn. In fact, the awesome thing is that if you've chosen a Lancer and leveled it all the way up to level 30 in A Realm Reborn, you actually will have several interactions with Astinian from there on out, making it really feel like he's a believable and real character within this world, rather than a new one that was purely created for Heaven's Ward. New people you will meet are Lord Fortin and his sons, at which his house you will be staying at. In the beginning, you will start with some minor tasks of helping House Fortin on checking the perimeter for heretic activity, but not too long after, you will get the bigger picture of the conflict that is at stake. The roaring cry of the dragons has been heard, and the giant dragon Nidhogg is planning an all-out assault against Ishgard with his army of drakes. 
For generations, the soldiers of Ishgard have been at war with the dragons, and you join Astinian and Alphano on a journey to seek out the dragons and hopefully find a peaceful way to end the conflict without too much bloodshed. You do this by also requesting the aid of the heretic leader Izel, also known as Lady Iceheart. She embodies a fracture of the spirit of Shiva, who in her time lay with the dragon Hrailsvalgar and opted for an eternal time of peace that was then disturbed by one side. Together with Astinian, Alphano and Izel, you travel to Dravania to seek an audience with the dragons. This journey is awesome and feels like another big build-up that slowly gets to a boiling point as you tag along. Now, I will say though, that I have seen some reviews of Heavensward labeling the story here as HBO level of storytelling, but I unfortunately do have to disagree with this to some extent. The whole Ulda Nanamo poisoning event definitely was of such a caliber in my opinion. But the story here with the main Heaven's War comes down to yet again journeying to a certain spot to accomplish peace. It's more the individual nuances, character relations and world building that shine in the spotlight here rather than the overall storytelling as a whole. Even worse, they use the trope again of you collecting the different colored crystals as your crystals have basically been closed off and you need to unlock them again. But for example, Estinian and Azel hate each other's guts and are constantly at once another's throat. But in the end, it can be seen that they respect one another greatly and are more like of mind than first thought. And it's not like that trope we see so much in movies where two characters don't like each other and then in the end they become best friends. Here you truly think they hate each other to the point where a deadly clash is unavoidable. And also, by the end, when they respect each other more, it's not like they are all buddy-buddy. That's just not simply their personality. And so these subtle character nuances really is what make the story interesting. And though the journey is very cool and you are amazed by all the new areas you get to explore and people you get to meet and interact, there are still points and areas that feel less in quality. The Mughal area especially is very repetitive with its quests and truly feels like filler and only there to stretch it out. You basically are tasked with performing mundane jobs for the lazy Mughal king. Luckily the questline does not take as long as the banquet quest before the titan fight, which by far is the worst questline in all of A Realm Reborn. Along the way it sometimes also becomes a bit predictable, with your first meeting with the dragons ending up with them wanting you to do something for them first. And that first thing is to fight an evil primal that has risen and you have to kill it yet again. Predictable yes, but on the other hand, the primal fights are of course the bread and butter of this game. It also is a huge plus that the primal fight that follows against the insect-like being with four arms and swords is awesome, as you fight in this arena with walls that crumble with certain attacks and positioning is yet again very important to avoid from falling off. It also should be said that before you embark on this long journey, you do also travel back to the desert to free Rauban, who has been captured and scheduled for execution. And something occurred to me here, which I really liked and what happens more in Heaven's Word, though especially also after the main scenario is over. Up until this point, there are often moments in the main story quest where you will take part in an instanced battle. These always have a cutscene before and after and basically up until this point revolved around a single battle with one or multiple enemies, pure and simple. But from here on out, you will get multiple instance moments where you are running and exploring through different places, almost playing like a mini dungeon for one player. With this instance in particular, you need to free Rauban, but a deadly poison has been unleashed as well. You first need to run around the area to find the machine that unleashes the gas so that it becomes safe again. All the while you do this, Rauban's health is slowly depleting, so there is a time element to make it a bit more exciting. Once you took care of the machine, you need to find the key and then go back all the way to free Rauban, where then a mini-boss fight unfolds. These dungeon-like moments for single-player instant missions are great and really makes them feel grander and of more importance than just simply a battle. There's now more to them than just fighting, and this is greatly appreciated. Later on, you get one where you and several soldiers attack the vault as some religious citizens have riled up and you get to explore the vault somewhat at your own leisure. There are no impatient party members who hinder you from enjoying it to the fullest. Now I will say this that is uh, something that I kind of disliked about the story, and that is that after you free Rauban, they actually reveal that Nanamo isn't in fact dead, but merely in sort of a coma. She eventually gets brought back and by the end lives on like nothing happened. 
Even though I liked her very much as a character, I would have preferred it if they had actually indeed killed her off during that epic scene, as now it kinda loses some weight. It feels more like a gotcha moment now where you think she is dead, but in fact all is well. And it isn't the same thing with the others like Ida, Papalimo, or Ishtola, where even though they sorta of pretend that they disappear or are maybe dead, there's no clear death scene, so you know that they will be fine. There's no gotcha moment present. But Nanamo was a brutal, sad, and shocking scene of her clamping at her throat and having her actually be killed here would make that whole situation so much more dramatic. In some ways, people might argue that in an MMO, one cannot make too big of a change since so many people share the same world, but even something as old as World of Warcraft have eradicated entire cities or zones which, even though the story sucks now, was a great potential story buildup when it happened. They also figured a way here to deal with the MMO situation by being able to travel through time to actually still visit the area if you wanted to. Anyway, I'm not too upset with this twist that Nanamo is alive, but they definitely should not do it too many times, where they pretend like someone is dead and then bring them back. Then it will honestly start feeling like Star Wars, where nowadays pretty much anyone who died comes back, which just is also part why Star Wars is so much less exciting now. They first kill Darth Maul, then he comes back. They kill Boba Fett, then he comes back. Kill Palpatine, then he comes back, etc, etc. Anyway, Back to the Ishgard and Dravania storyline. After completing your journey, you finally meet with the somewhat peaceful Reisvalgar and ask him if nothing can be done to keep the peace between the dragons and Ishgard. Here he reveals the truth about the history between the humans and dragons and that it were the humans that first betrayed the peacekeeping by slaughtering the female dragon sister of Nidhogg, which then, in a blind rage, attacked and lost his eyes in the fight. The same eye that grants Estinian the great strength to become the Azur Dragoon. What's interesting about the story here is that though it's a story told a thousand times over, there's actually some great depth and philosophical discussions to be had here. We have seen time and time again where there is a war between two factions and the faction we first think are the good guys are actually the instigators. You then end up fighting for the other side, which are basically the victims. We've seen this in movies like Dances with Wolves or The Last Samurai or Avatar. Though the story in Heaven's Ward initially feels like it sets up this all too familiar plot, it actually goes a bit further to explore this scenario which is very much appreciated. See, this war between dragons and humans has raged on for many generations and the humans that are alive nowadays had nothing to do with the initial betrayal against dragonkind. But it was this never diminishing rage and want for revenge by Nidhogg who vowed to torture and punish all of the Ishgardians kin who were responsible, thereby condemning all the generations to come for torment over and over even though they were not responsible for his pain and loss. It kind of reminded me on how in our actual daily lives here in the real world have still a surprising and shocking amount of people who feel hatred or disdain for certain countries and its citizens for something that happened a long time ago of a previous generation. Countries like Germany or Japan are still so hated by so many people out there for what happened 80 years ago. Most of the people in both countries nowadays weren't even alive back then, yet still the subject gets brought up when one flies in a fit of rage. I've heard my father, who's German by the way, mention that there's something people call inheritance of guilt, where in this world people act like you inherit the guilt of your own forefathers, and you know what? He is absolutely right. Now this of course differs on how severe the atrocities were, but for example there are still now people demanding repercussions for slavery even though the modern European had nothing to do with that. Yet our forefathers had, and as weird as it sounds, many people in this world then believe that it's our burden to bear this guilt even though I personally disagree with that. Now I do think that one never should deny nor look away from the atrocities done by your people or family, but bearing the guilt when one has nothing to do with it is not a necessity in my opinion. And this thing that I explained here also gets brought up in the story. Nidhogg is so obsessed with his anger and revenge that even though it were indeed the humans that committed treason first, Nidhogg's revenge has gotten to the point where he is terrorizing those who bear no guilt and thus he needs to be stopped. I was so scared for a moment that it would take the easy route and have us join the dragons and then fight against Ishgard, but the story never does that. It really takes on that difficult subject of loss, betrayal, 
grief and ultimately revenge and how long that can last and rotten one's soul. So you actually head on over to take out Nidhogg and his generals to bring back the peace as you vow to convince the Ishgardians to lay down their weapons as well. And basically, with that, the Dragon War seems over. But the story then shifts and focuses on the corrupted Archbishop who's in bed with the Ashens to secure a secret key and head towards a sacred place to unlock an ancient power which they will use to silence anyone who opposes them and in their eyes bring peace. Though the story then does come down to the more classic and predictable go after evil and stop it, there are still enough interesting twists and turns to keep you occupied and avoid it from feeling boring or all too predictable. First, I should also say that the knights accompanying the Archbishop are absolutely awesome. They each can transform in these giant versions that straight up look like they came out of a Dark Souls game. Each and everyone's design is fantastic and brutal looking. It is during one of these dungeons where you are chasing the Archbishop and his knights that another important character dies, this time in the form of Lord Horshafon. Horshafon is another praiseworthy character who really was fleshed out through all the encounters in both A Realm Reborn and Heavensward. I remember when I first met him, I thought that he was a bit of a creep and I thought at several times that he was maybe, uh, hitting on me? <laughs> But he turned out to be a truly great friend, being there for me, Alphano and Tataru when we had to flee Ulda and fighting along our side at some of the most important clashes in Ishgard. He was always so positive and even bummed out if he wasn't present at one of the fights we were involved in. A true knight who craved nothing but glorious battle to have tales and songs mention his name. The cutscene where he dies is a bit predictable, though since it's kind of signaled in a way that he dies where he holds the shield up to protect you and the beam of light then breaks and crushes the shield where then he gets mortally wounded. He dies at your side, wanting to see you smile one last time before the life in his eye fades. I've heard it be said that people who played Final Fantasy XIV have come close or actually cried multiple times and I got to admit that I haven't really, not even with this scene. Though the closest I got was actually with another Horshafon scene where later at the end of Heaven's Ward, you put the broken shield at his grave and Tataru puts flowers by it as she says something sweet. It was very sad yet beautiful at the same time and that got to me a little bit. When the Archbishop managed to get away, you and your group need to try and figure out how to catch up with them as the Archbishop and his men have traveled beyond a magical barrier. In what follows, you bring back Ishtola travel to the homeland of some of the Scions, a place that is really beautiful by the way, and meet up with Ishoda's former master Matoya, a character I personally did not really know or had any connection with, but I believe she's a big character from one of the earlier Final Fantasy games. The dungeon associated with her story arc is very cool though, as you are fighting bosses that represent storybooks and have some fun and cool mechanics as well. Basically all the dungeons and bosses are top notch in Heaven's Ward. The Race Valgar trial is also great, where you battle him as you stand on these platforms and need to hop from platform to platform to prevent from falling off as he crushes multiple of them at once. Then as you manage to get past the magical barrier, a large Imperial airship is trying to destroy yours and you are saved by a final and desperate attack by Izel as she transforms into Shiva once more and sacrifices her own life so that you can save Ishgard and the realm. Izel also is a fantastic character, with a great voice actress and acting to boot. She starts out as the cold and brutal leader of the heretics, though you can kind of see it coming that she will have a change of heart or at least become more of a major character that you may be side with. She is so convinced that she is the reincarnation or at least the spirit bearer of Shiva that she thinks quite highly of herself and believes this holy crusade to reunite with the dragons to be her destiny. But it is revealed by Ravesvalgar that the Shiva she turns into is a bit of fraction, a mere shadow of what the actual Shiva truly was. This Shiva was simply conjured up by her emotions of despair and this realization absolutely breaks Azel. It's yet another beautiful and deep philosophical topic about blind faith and not questioning anything anyone says to be the absolute truth. Having her also die made it indeed to where the stakes for this expansion and story were a lot higher, since we have lost some important characters like Moonbrita, Horshafon, and now Azel. There's definitely more loss to be had in Heavensward compared to A Realm Reborn, and that gets appreciated. Now again, I'm not some emo dude who loves it just, you know, because people die, 
but this fact that important characters can and will die makes it to where I feel there are real stakes to be had. If all of them survived all the time, I would not be as invested, or on the edge of my seat, since I already know everything is going to be alright. After her sacrifice, you will head into the final dungeon, and then also the final confrontation with the Archbishop, who by now has transformed into a giant, magnificent, godly knight. Yet another design that could be straight up a Dark Souls boss. The cool thing too, is that he betrays the Ashens and is so powerful that he makes absolute mincemeat of the bad guys like the Habrea, who still lingered on from a realm reborn and were no longer that interesting. Good riddance. The final fight against the Archbishop is also awesome, with all of his 12 knights joining the fight and each has drastically different mechanics. It's a great fight, and at the end, you return the items that stood at the base of the Archbishop's power, both of Nidhogg's eyes. Astinian grabs the eyes, but is overtaken by its power and transforms into Nidhogg, who vows to return with yet a vengeance rarely witnessed. You then return to Ishgard, and with the Archbishop gone, it is up to Sir Emmerich to take up the mantle of ruler, and that's it. The credits then start to roll. In all honesty, it was a magnificent journey with great characters, great storytelling and twists, but this ending felt a bit sudden, and like there were still quite a lot of unanswered plot elements and questions. It was clear, for example, that the battle with Nidhogg would still have to be fought, and it was different than the abstract hint to Bahamut at the end of A Realm Reborn with the roar at the end. Despite that roar, A Realm of Reborn's ending felt like a proper end of a chapter and story as a whole, but with Heaven's Ward, it definitely feels like you are still in it. Ishgard yet is not safe at all. And as mentioned before, the way this felt with the storytelling is that the next two or three patches, up until the actual war with Nidhogg and his forces, was the proper ending for the Heaven's War storyline. After the end credits, there's also of course a stinger yet again, to kind of showcase what comes next, and it had me wonder on who would be the next big bad guy. La Habrea had been dealt with, Von Belsar was no more, and the war with Nidhogg would probably be resolved within the next patches. Was it going to be the Emperor? A new primal? Nope. The game threw me for a loop yet again as they revealed the Warrior of Darkness. I was so surprised, though if you think about it, it's such a logical and, dare I even say, a bit of a cliché trope. But what I thought was really cool was that these Warriors of Darkness were the characters from the CG cutscenes. I lost my mind when I saw the little Lalafell healer, or the Catgirl archer, and I recognized them from the intro. It should also be said that the voice actor of the Warrior of Darkness is really good and fitting. Now I thought that they were going to be the next main big bad guy, but by now as I write this I'm already 6 hours or so into Stormblood, so I know by now that they're only there for a short time, and yes, I also by now know about the supposed betrayal of Uriange. Anyway, the story continues after the credits with you finding yet another lost scion in the form of Thancred. Armed with a new cool look, making him look even more like Dante from Devil May Cry, and of course, a new voice actor, I was glad to have him back in the party. The interesting thing about the story is that it shows the direct ramifications and consequences of the war and how the common folk feel about it. The higher-ups want peace, but so many are still scarred and traumatized by losing loved ones due to the dragons, meaning to a lot of people, the peace does not seem to be an option. There's a great yet somewhat creepy cutscene where your character gets drugged by a seemingly nice barmaid who then afterwards holds a speech to rile up the people against the peace treaty. This is also just a nail-bitingly tense cutscene since she is then shot brutally by one of the Lord's soldiers, of course then resulting in the boiling rage by all the commoners who stood by and watched. Yet unfortunately, the game once more does go out of its way to just wound her slightly and not mortally. The same can be said for yet another great cutscene where one of the dragon's adversaries flies over to Ishgard to discuss the peace terms. Before the official peace can be made, Estinian, who has now been possessed by the spirit of Nidhogg, appears out of nowhere and strikes brutally at the dragon, seemingly killing it. Yet again, the dragon is not dead. As said before, by now I am well underway within Stormblood content and the writer of Heaven's Ward is not the same writer as Stormblood or Shadowbringers. I believe Stormblood is written by two writers, but one of them is responsible for the main Shadowbringer storyline, and she received a standing ovation apparently at PAX since the story supposedly was so good. 
I'm very curious and looking forward to what she will bring to the table, but I can already tell you that there were a few cutscenes in Stormblood that actually went through with it and killed some characters in Cold Blood. Anyway, with the Dragon Emissary being attacked, Nidhogg plans his final assault and you, Alphano, and Sir Emmerich head to Railsfalgar to call his aid to fight alongside you. In order to do this, you have to go through an awesome dungeon and then the final battle commences and boy is it epic. I'm not kidding in that it does the dragon battles here better than something like Game of Thrones. Sure, Game of Thrones animations and CG is much better, but this battle here at least is not as dark as for example the battle against all of the Walking Dead, and you can actually see what the hell is happening, and the skill is really epic too. The dragons fly over, scorching the place, and torching soldiers or picking any unlucky ones up and dropping them into the abyss below. It really feels like an epic climax and a last stand where everything comes together. There's also an awesome twist here, where Railsvalgar actually loses the battle against Nidhogg, but instead gifts his eye to none other than you, the Warrior of Light. I was once again screaming at my monitor, something I don't do often by the way, but I've done multiple times with Final Fantasy XIV. I think that's also because none of the story plots have been spoiled to me, and in this day and age with social media, it is so difficult to avoid spoilers for shows, movies, or games. You then head into the final fight of Heavensward as I see it, where you and other players take on Nidhogg, and it's a pretty challenging fight which is great. It doesn't feel too easy, and it feels earned to have this at the crescendo to the end of the saga of the Dragon Song Wars. You then free Astinian from the power of Nidhogg's eyes, in yet another wonderful and emotional cutscene where you remember both Horshafon and Izel as you rescue your friend. Yeah, this one got to me in the feels a bit yet again. You then throw the eyes in the abyss, which uh, at the time I thought was a bad idea, since others could just go and pick it up and lo and behold, later in the storyline this actually gets addressed. But for now, with Astinian back on its feet and peace officially begun, Heaven's War is finally at its end. What a journey. I felt incredible to see the game step up its game and offer a story and experience that goes beyond the regular MMO types. I should soon take another look on how the Old Republic has improved over the years with its story, but for now, I can say that Heavensward, without a doubt, is the best story I have played for an MMORPG. It's not perfect, with still a few hiccups here and there in terms of pacing, mostly with the Moogles or returning to saving Nanamo, etc., but the story at those points doesn't really move forward and can feel even a little bit like filler. I also wish that they were a bit more hard set on going through with certain choices or things hinted at, like particular characters dying. The length of this is also incredible, since from the moment the prologue begins to Heaven's Ward until the moment that the book closes, you will play a good 30 or so hours, and that is still on just focusing on the main quests. Heaven's Ward pretty much improves on every part compared to A Realm Reborn to make it a very fun experience with great pacing throughout, and the dungeons are better. The boss battles are better, the story is better, the music is better, and the overall experience is all the better for it. As said, there is still room for improvement, which hopefully we will see with the upcoming Stormblood and Shadowbringers reviews. But for now, Final Fantasy XIV Heaven's Ward gets an 8.7. By now, as I write this, I am well underway with Stormblood, and though the new locations like Kugane are absolutely breathtaking, and I can clearly see the increase of no longer being held back by the PlayStation 3, I I do have to admit that the story does not have that much of an oomph yet, and I'm already 6 hours in. Heaven's Ward's story of course started out with a bang, and one heck of a build up. This time, that is not the case however, but I hope that the story will unfold in something very memorable just yet.